Tom here from Warren Systems, and we're going to talk about Bitwarden, the open source password manager. If you want to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. There's a hires button at the top if you'd like to hire us for a project. If you would like to support the channel in other ways, there are affiliate links below for products and services that we uh, talk about on this channel that often get you a discount. I don't have one, though, for Bitwarden. And this is me talking about Bitwarden because we switched to it. Uh, there's no paid endorsement. I know no one at Bitwarden. I'll just make sure that's out and clear there. I will disclose ever, as always, if something was ever a paid endorsement. Um, but my positive review of this, I'll just let you know, yes, I like it. Yes, I use it for those of you uh, too long didn't watch people. Um, it's a great password manager. Now, previously, I've done several videos on LastPass, and to my knowledge, there's no flown flaws in LastPass. I'm not switching because I know that there's some major security problem with it. And I have also done videos about security problems found with LastPass and how fast they were at fixing them was really impressive. It's a solid password manager. I don't think LastPass is a bad product. But I, when possible, I always like to prefer an open source product. And a lot of people have asked me why I'm not using Bitwarden. Well, my first answer, which was solved, was the fact that Bitwarden was not code, edit, code audited. And when companies uh, make a new product, it doesn't necessarily mean I I'm going to trust all of my most important passwords to that product. Uh, that's obviously trust has to be earned. And in security, trust has to be audited. Make sure that was this program written in a secure manner. Now, both LastPass and Bitwarden, um, LastPass being one of the first to market, making them one of the biggest and why they're so popular, uh, and they do make a good product. It stores the passwords in a vault, so there's a supposed to be, and to my knowledge is, a zero trust. That means zero trust is you decrypt within the browser, so the passwords are decrypted by you through a master password and not the LastPass system itself, or in this case, Bitwarden. So what they're going to, each of these companies do is have a business model where they hand, handle passing and storing the encrypted vault and your master password that you set decrypts the vault with them having zero knowledge. And this goes back a long time from a business model standpoint, uh, back to LavaBit, LeVar Levison, and they realized that, well, he had the passwords and could decrypt some of the encrypted email that LavaBit had. Therefore, the government was able to compel them or even attackers could possibly get a hold of those keys. LastPass decided uh, in their earliest inception that they would encrypt it without knowledge of understanding what the passwords are because you can't compel LastPass to give up a password with all the uh, information in it if they don't have it. Bitwarden built on the same thing but they decided to make it open source. So while LastPass has gone through a code review as well and is vetted by third parties, it's still not an open source product. So now we're gonna dive into Bitwarden, which is an open source product and which has completed third party security audit. This was a very important step to me. And this happened, I know a little while ago, but I, I still the pain of switching. Um, well, I thought it would be more painful than it was. It was kind of like, well, we have an entire workflow. I have shared passwords between my team here at Lawrence Systems. And you know, LastPass was a great solution because well, it made working very easy. So let's start here at the front page. Solve your password management problems, the easiest and safest ways for individuals, teams, and business organizations that store and share and sync sensitive data. Install now, it's free. So their business model is very similar to other password managers that there is a complete free version. They will host the vault and you can create a free account, which I have, and we're gonna demo it. And they also have a pay model where they do enterprise solutions where you can dive into, and we'll actually just look at it real quick so you don't understand the pricing and what you get. Um, when you dive into the enterprise, it, $3 per user per month is actually a really, that's really reasonable, I think, for the amount of features that they offer on here. So user groups, directory sync, on-premise hosting, uh, event audit logs, API access, multi-factor um, with TOTP, and of course, things like dual security and UB keys, and they have a lot of other features there, which is awesome if you wanna go into the higher end model. The free for user allows sharing up to two users. So if you and one other family member want to use this and uh, share passwords securely between each other, that is supported right in free version. The family plan at a dollar a month for five users. Yeah, that's just really inexpensive. Now, this is where some people Sometimes people conflate things. They assume open source always means free. The code is all free. The code is all on GitHub. They're doing the hosting and things like that. That's part of what some of those fees are for. So those fees that come into this, um, if you wanna grab all the source code and build it all yourself, absolutely. They have made 100% of the source code available. It's all right here, documentation and everything. The apps they have, everything. So I 
throwing it out there for those that always seem to ask that question when companies charge for certain things, you're paying for some of the hosting and some of the features, uh, and they do have some premium features that do require licensing if you self-host this as well, but if you wanted to spin the source code and not just download it from Docker, yes, you could remove the licensing, just so I'm clear on all that. So we're up front. Create a free account, easy enough to do. I have one created over here and we're gonna go into Vault for a second. Syncs between all the devices, that's awesome. Desktop apps, they have a Windows, Mac, and Linux app. Uh, web browser extensions for Chrome, Safari, uh, Firefox, Vidalvi, Brave, Tor Browser, Edge, and Opera. Like I said, mobile app, command line, that's actually kinda cool too. And of course, the Web Vault. And of course, here is the open source st uh, statement. Check out our GitHub and they have everything on there. The Docker images. This is the self-hosted system. And uh, I'll cover this a little bit more at the end, but you, the, the self-hosting is great on this. It works really, really well. I, we have it set up and then we chose the self-hosting to reduce our threat surface. And right here's the personal uh, premium accounts, the couple extra things that you get. Uh, both of them, and this is where sometimes people have confusion. Yes, you can have two-factor authentication um, without the premium account. What they're talking about here, the TOTP authenticator and key storage, I don't use this feature, but it's kind of novel that they can do this. And we'll cover what that is. It basically allows you to save your TOTP, your time-based authentication passwords, and have it create them. Um, but that kind of breaks certain rules of two-factor, and I'll explain that shortly here. And more details about the whole system. I guess the company's very open, open source. Uh, their business model is really, really clean, and they're got a really solid system that has now been vetted. Now let's look at like the desktop app. I have it running in Linux here. Uh, I have a demo account set up on here. So you can go through and see, I got a couple logins saved in there. We're gonna cover them in a couple different ways, but uh, I didn't find any problems with the demo account um, or setting up a demo account and running it in an application here in window. Um, I've also got the browser plugin set up here. And well, actually one of the cool things is you can and it says this both for Chrome and Firefox. Uh, this allows you to pop it out like this. So I can just, you know, use it and have it without loading an application, have it popped out and do look at my vault, look at the collections and things like that. And of course, then we can log into things via the actual web vault right here, which I got to get the password to and unlock because it timed out. And I put a really long password in there. Now, this is also something I found kind of interesting is uh, you can be logged in here and edit things and not at the same time be logged into the web version. Uh, they keep these things separate so you can go to vault.bitwarden.com when you're running this and it decrypts it in there. Now, an interesting thing about the way it decrypts, just so you know, when you send your master password, they bring what they call the encrypted blob to the browser and they aren't getting your master password back. They're doing the decryption in browser. This is how they keep from knowing your master password. Uh, they've developed in the system, once again, it's open source and being vetted. They developed this so they don't send the master password back to them to decrypt it, because then, well, then they would have your master password, and if they had it, um, they would be compelled, or could be compelled to do it, or the risk of them being attacked would allow people and attackers potentially to get in. So let me log in here and get the password real quick. All right, and I'm logged in. So. No matter which one I log into, they're all in sync with each other all the time. So this was the popped out with the Chrome extension. I have just a couple things saved in here because this is just the demo account. Uh, this is where you can look at the generator. You can import uh, data. Matter of fact, this is um, how you would switch it from LastPass and wow, this was easy. I think I have over, I pruned them down a little bit, right around seven or 800 passwords uh, that I needed copied over. When you run and do the export, you just go to export with LastPass and they link to the article of how to export from LastPass. You copy that and paste it in, or you can save it as a CSV file. And it imported flawlessly. I would, that part was way less pain than I thought. So switching was actually really, really easy for me. And my understanding is switching from some of the other ones is easy. Now, you can also, on the other side of this, export your vault. Uh, and it exports in JSON or CSV. You put your master password in there and you can then export the file and then you have it. It's in a JSON file or a CSV file if you wanted to put it in a spreadsheet. They do, I like any company that supports a solid data liberation process, which means I can get all the data that I put into this product back out of the product if I wanted to, then I can put it somewhere else if, if I wanted to do so. Now, back to a couple of our features of the vault. So we're gonna look right here. Um, well, let's go and edit this actually. 
This is where, this is a premium feature as it says right here, the rolling TOT, T, TOTP numbers. So if you have a premium account, you can put this in here. That means your username and your password and then the third party authentication, that extra token could all be stored right in here. To me, I mean, I think this is a great convenience, but security and convenience are always at odds with each other. Doing it this way means if I stored this in here and somehow someone got into my vault because I've been compromised, my master password was compromised, someone figured it out and they figured out how to get into my vault, they now have the pieces of information, both of them needed to log into my next piece of account. For example, right now, because I don't keep my TOTP authenticator key in here, if they were to get in and I was on a site that also had a third party authentication, it would stop them from doing it because they would need my external, which in this case is my phone, which has the rolling numbers on it. So leave it up to you if you wanna put that in there. I, I think it's cool that they offer it. I think it's a bit risky. Now, other things about the interface. Um, this is the test login for PFSense. Um, easy enough. Now, what about if we wanted to do another custom field? This is another feature. So we got a notes field here, but let's say uh, the other password some other key that you might, well, let's say the VPN key, because we, we have that created separately and uh, we'll put some random junk in here and just like that. But now we hit save. And now what we've done is when we go and look at this particular item, I can not have it exposed, but go in here and just copy the value for the VPN key because I wanted to store some extra piece of information about this site login. Maybe those are security questions you answered. This can all be stored in here. Maybe there's some other pieces of information that are pertinent to whether it's a firewall, like I'm doing as a demo here, so it's a PF Sense box, or whatever that is. Sometimes sites have a few extra questions they want to ask, and maybe you want to have those as a text. Maybe you want to have those as hidden to copy and paste the answers in a series of questions that you answered. Now, not answering those questions the same on each site when they ask you, like what your mother's maiden name is, this helps do that. So you can come up with a random answer for every website. So too many places use that mother's maiden name or some type of arbitrary information that you can probably find about a person. Um, that's why it's better to make things up, but then you can't just make them up and forget them because then you wouldn't be able to get back in if there was ever a problem. So making them up and saving them inside of here and having a series of fields, great way to use it. Uh, it does support full organization of things like folders. Uh, so you're able to um, I don't have any created in this demo account, but you can organize everything into a series of folders like my social media accounts or my web accounts or my server accounts. Now, the difference between this test and this Tom login are one belongs to an organization and one belongs to me. This is where I think they did an amazing job. Uh, you don't share passwords uh, based on the object inside of here. So if each password, let's say, is an object, so we want to share this with someone else, we can. But... Normally, the way you would do it in LastPass, just, and I don't know every password manager, but LastPass would do it, is it's kind of a, I want to share this and would have a list of users that I shared with it. They break everything down in here in Bitwarden using organizations. I really, this is just great. So we create a new organization. We'll call this one Demo2. So, uh, yep, Bitwarden Demo at LearnSystems.com. And this is where the licensing kicks in. And this applies to self-hosted or not. So I'm just gonna make that very clear. Free, limited to two users, including you. So it's really just you and one other person, limited to collections. You can only, because each organization then can have a collection underneath it. And if the free plan only lets you have two collections, the collections are essentially like folders underneath it. So maybe some are related to the business or however you wanna break those down maybe department, if you want to consider an organization a company, and then maybe you create a series of departments under there, and there's full granular permissions for each person you share this with, which is actually really nice. You can then upgrade to the family plan for a dollar a month, really inexpensive. With the family plan, on-premise hosting is an option. Because once you create these, this is the, not gotcha, but it's something that I was a little unclear on, um, reading through and now I've set this all up, I understand a little better now, you can get an on-premise license. The way you set an on-premise, if you wanna self-host this up, is you would create this here, create the account, buy the family plan, even though you're gonna use self-hosted, you still have to create an account with the same name. So the username is gonna be your email address, so I had to create one with my email address at Bitwarden. I had to buy the plan, even though I don't keep it in their vault because I'm hosting it myself, you have to buy the license here. 
then you get to download and export the license, and then you import it into your self-hosted, and the email addresses have to match, just uh, FYI on that. That was the part I was a little bit fuzzy on that maybe they could add to their documentation. Teams. Teams is cool, but downside about Teams, the on-premise hosting part, missing. So for a business, I was thinking, hey, the Teams account seems like what I want. Oddly, you don't get to uh, on-premise host this. So you can buy the Teams account and host it with their vault, but Teams doesn't allow you to download the license. Neither does the free plan. Uh, you can't create an organization without a license for the on-prem. So you had to go with the enterprise one, which does have on-premise hosting, but at $3 a user per month, it's really reasonably inexpensive. So that's, uh, for a business use case, uh, that's just, yeah, great price. Especially because you get all these features that you want for a business. Anyway, unlimited collections, uh, share with unlimited users, and control user access with groups, uh, track changes and log audits. They give you, well, all the business and enterprise class tools you want to create a shared password manager that they don't even host. So yes, I said in the beginning, they're a trusted company, but if you want to reduce your threat service more, you don't even publicly expose your Bitwarden server in any way. That way in the future, if any flaw was found, you have self-hosted this and the only way accessible in the way we set this up is internally with the VPN. So it's completely locked down to an internal network with a lot of access restriction rules around it. Therefore, reducing if there, for example, was a flaw ever found in Bitwarden, I'm sure they would be quick to fix it, but not having it exposed means there was never a chance to exploit that flaw. Uh, so there, there's important reasons you may want to do it. It's not for everybody. And a matter of fact, their hosting, um, I've been, I set up some demo accounts and tried a few things with their hosted version. Matter of fact, I moved all my personal stuff uh, that I, uh, you know, games and stuff I play all to their hosted version that they offer the hosting for and bought it as a premium and I'm thrilled with it. It works great. It's fast. I've not had any um, issues at all. They seem to have a really solid platform. So with all that, we'll go back over here, go back over here. And how do we get things in and out of there? Well, it's kind of a one-way operation. I bring that up because right now I own Test, but the demo org here owns Tom, this other login. And so when we log in, and we'll actually go here and log in and out, just this was handy to have. So if we want to log in, we've got two options because I saved two different passwords here. So we got the Tom one, which we can log in right here. All right, now logged in. And then we're going to log out. And this can be really any website. This was just handy. I happen to have this sitting here with PFSense. Um, we did the login over here with the little button, and now we're going to log in with test. And we can log in with that. Now, test is owned by me, but anyone who I shared in the demo organization. So we look at demo org and we can um, invite some user. We invite this user. This is the owner. And so I have full permissions, but then the demo user, another menu would pop up and let us granularly control all the permissions of who can see what inside of here. I, I didn't want to show this on mine because it has all of my staff's email addresses in it of how we delegate this out. And that would be <clears throat> more than I'm willing to share today <laughs> in terms of that. But then you can break down with that premium one, each one of these. You can go through and granularly give permissions. But once this gets moved into, and let me show you how to move something in there. We'll move test in here now as well. We're going to share what collection, default collection over with demo. You could have as many collections as you want, have everyone organize them. This is a one-way operation. Once you've taken something and it's not in your vault, it is now part of the organizational vault. It does give it a little sharing on there, but it I didn't see any way to remove the share. Once it's done, you you have to cop you have to reset it up back into your account, uh, your personal one once it's in the organization. So it's just kind of a I, uh, only feature I really complained about, so to speak, would be that, that I wouldn't mind being able just to take something out of an org and say, I don't want to share that anymore. So once you decide to share something, you've shared it, you can delete it out of there, no problem. But there's not a way to say, move this back over so Tom owns it and it's not shared with the group that is in that organization. Uh, so just a little FYI now. Now, a few other things they have in here that's also really nice. The organizations work just like the vault. So under my vault, I can say, I want to create a new login. I can want to look at cards. I want to look at identities. So let's add an identity item. So identity item is going to be, I want to put in uh, my title, all the information. So when I go to a website, it just can fill all this out. Email, address, phone, you know, and I have one of these filled out for my business. Card, add item. We can put different cards in here. I, and we can, you know, I say you change it as you go down right here. 
So name, folder, uh, card holder name, Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, et cetera. Custom fields that you may want in there. Who owns this item is down here at the bottom. And this is what I really like. So uh, we do need to share certain card information and stuff like that with our vault. So we put things, or I should say I do, I put them in the shared folder right from the go. So I have certain things I want them to fill out. I have cards I want to share with my staff. When you want to share those cards, I just throw them right into the shared organization and the staff members that have the permission for that particular folder now have access to be able to buy something and use one of the company credit cards right from here and fill it in. This is really solid the way they did this. This is just, I really like it. Now, let's demo real quick what it looks like to actually, so make sure we log in as Tom. So we'll go choose the Tom login here. And actually let's uh, delete the other login. So we'll delete the test login. So back to all items. And uh, even though it's in the shared one, it is to be, yep, we're gonna delete that. I don't even know what the password is for test. Doesn't matter though. So make sure we uh, refresh the page. Yep, there's only one login now. We're gonna choose the Tom login. And this is my demo server. So yes, that password is that short. <laughs> Still can't have it, but it's short because it's a demo server for this particular demo I just spun up. So let's go over here to user manager. Now, I, granted you'd be doing something completely different. If you're creating a login for a site, it has these type of options, but we'll use the password generators to show you how it works. So uh, we'll go here. I'm just gonna hit over to the generator and you can choose some of the options longer, however you want the password to be. This seems like enough characters right here. Uh, do you want it to have which characters, uppercase, lowercase, uh, minimum amount of numbers, special characters, avoid ambiguous characters. There are plenty of little options that you can do there. Um, and keep hit ring generate till you see. I think that looks good. So we're gonna copy the password. Password copied and we'll just paste, paste. Now because this field is labeled password just by me hitting save here, even though I've already got Tom saved, it says should Bitwarden remember this password for you? Yeah, save it. So back over to Bitwarden here, back over to my vault. Instantly, it's saved right there. And by the way, I've left this open in the background. It's saved right here. It, it is in sync. So as these changes are happening, the Bitwarden uh, tool right here is syncing all of it and it's working all in real time for anything that we add. And now I can have this in my vault and we can see the password it generated right here be able to view it and away we go. It remembers the thing. Now, something about match detection is kind of cool too. This is really nice that they have this built in here. You can change the default rules on it, but you can have things like, I want it to be an exact match for this. So only use this password when I'm at this particular URL or you can edit it um, so this or URI is exactly this. So you can say, I want it to be exact match for this. And this is kind of a nice feature as well in, uh, that you can do this on easily do this on a per item basis. So I really like that. Now, the last thing I'm gonna talk about, cause I mean, we didn't do some of this. It's, uh, these are a couple other premium features that I guess we can cover real quick, like exposed password report, reuse password report, weak password. No, they don't just send your password to uh, have it been pwned. Uh, they create a hash of it and do a hash comparison. So I thought that was nice that they built those things in. Uh, that's definitely really cool. And under the settings, um, this is where you have some of the other options, the change the billing options, lock options, your organizations, uh, everything else, billing, two-step login, they support, uh, with the not pay, this is a 100% free one here, um, Authenticator app, and I'm using not Google Authenticator, but Authenticator Plus. I don't know if I did a video on it or not, but it's a great app to use uh, for doing TOTP authentication, but they have all the support for that. You can also uh, have your ver verifications emailed to you, um, but this is way better to do something like this right here. But please note, if you ever lose the password to this uh, or lose your Authenticator app key and all that, you're not getting back in. They can't help you. They don't have your password. So it's really important when you set this up initially and create the master password that you just don't lose it. Now, finally, let's talk though about how you self-host Bitwarden. And uh, this has been great. Um, oh, yeah, let me close this window, but yes, they have a uh, bug bounty program. I guess we can just mention that, worth mentioning for sure. All right, they have a breakdown for, like I said, they have license fees, those license fees. Well, 
they do apply to self-hosting. I just want to reiterate that just because you're self-hosting it, you would have to recompile the code to remove the fact that it requires a license for certain other premium features. The code's available, have at it guys. Installing and deploying this. This is really well done. They've done a great job. So too long, don't read, right here. Just all you really need is your DNS records to point and have uh, ports 80 and 443 open. So if you want to self-host this, uh, your domain, you know, you call whoever you want, bitwarden.yourdomain.com. Really straightforward. They have a great installer that is very, very automated. Um, and what this does is grabs this uh, really basic bitwarden.sha script. It goes to the bitwarden downloader. It grabs this. The only prerequisites are Docker and Docker Compose. I built this running a server running Debian 10. No problem. I didn't load anything else on it. It's a bare bones. I loaded uh, Docker on it. That's it. And I wanted to create this with the absolute minimum. So once you want to install, install and deploy Bitwarden, run their tool here. Uh, then you run bitwarden install, start, and away we go. And they have a couple options of how to do this in PowerShell, how to do this uh, if you want to adjust things. Now, this is a part that I think is really great. They did an excellent job. Now, this is best practice in Docker. Anyways, they do a solid job of separating data from runtime environment. So you're when you build this all in Docker, and this is, to me, absolutely great. Like I said, I, uh, I'm just happy with the whole way they have, you know, um, here's how to set up Docker, Docker Compose, install the Bitwarden. We're going to run through some of this. But they have, and it grabs all the proper Docker images that are nice, built, compiled. You're not compiling any of the code, but they create a separated data folder. So your data folder is located in wherever you download and install this, and then Docker runs. The Docker images get updated whenever there's updates, but your data stays safe. By the way, when it comes to backups, inside of this virtual machine that I created, they create a backup folder and every night it creates a backup of my Bitwarden uh, files. You can also yourself, all you have to do is grab this BW data folder that it creates and away you go. That's all you have to do to back it up. So you just keep backing up BW data and, and pretty straightforward. Also, um, they have things like this. When you go into the environment variables under BW data environment, you set things that you need to have set up. So smtp.sengrid, um, port 587, username, API key, sign API key, etc., etc. But one of the things that's very important if you self-host, if you want the self-hosting to work properly, you have to have the mail server set up. That's why they have these in here, and that's one of the reasons they're pointing this out. Even if you self-host, when you create new users, you can't even activate the premium license fee because you download the license from your logged in version of Bitwarden. You then log into your self-hosted version and then you put your license key in. But the license key has to match your email address and your email address has to be verified. That's an important step. So make sure you have access to a mail server that you can send information through. Um, and there's a lot of, you can search for different mail server types that work for this. But you know, is, make sure you have this right now. As of right now, but not in the future, you probably could use something like Google Less Secure Apps, look that up. But Google is also, my understanding, deprecating Less Secure Apps, so that may work for now. The other thing you need to email to work for is when you invite others to share. So you have other users, like in my, my team, for example, as they create accounts on here, I needed to share the keys uh, with them to put them in the different organizational groups and the different collections. That also is an email generated. Now, once they're shared, you don't really need a mail server anymore, but you will get mail notifications unless you turn them off for new logins and new login attempts, which I do like quite a bit. So here's a few of the other script commands and they made this really easy. So what if there's a new version of Bitwarden? How do you update it? Well, that's actually pretty easy. Um, update all containers in a database. They have an update. Uh, update the main script. Update all containers without restarting and running instance and uh, rebuild them. There's also a standard uh, config YAML file so you can edit the config. And once you edit these configs or these environments, please note, and this is a Docker thing, that you need to rebuild the Docker because once it starts all these instances and grabs the latest versions of them, it uses the config files, but you have to start and stop them again and rebuild them to say, hey, grab those config files again because I made changes. Um, they do also offer instructions on entire manual installation. And when it comes to keys, they support both Let's Encrypt for uh, when you, if you need to have a key signed, they support Let's Encrypt, they support self-signed, and they support your own, and they have instructions on each. For a company not just giving away the source code saying here it is, to take the time to build out these entire Docker images with detailed instructions of how to set it up, 
um, that is outstanding. This is one of the reasons that I was really impressed. Like they they went the extra mile, in my opinion, to go through and do this to say, hey, you know, some companies are open source and say, you know, their business model is we'll sell access or whatever. But uh, when it comes to if you want to run this on your own, well, cool. Here's just a pile of source code. Uh, they don't always take the time to build really solid detailed instructions on how to set it up, how to update it. And they kind of in, almost encourage you, for those of you that want to self-host, awesome, away you go. Now, a couple notes about the self-hosting. Self-signed key versus Let's Encrypt. So awesome they have Let's Encrypt. But if you do this and you set this up on your server, whether it's a uh, hosted in the cloud like DigitalOcean, or if it's going to be on-prem like we're doing um, within our own stack, you do need to have your DNS records and Let's Encrypt posted to get a signed cert or buy a signed cert somewhere and install it. And like I said, they have those instructions there. The reason you need that is if you want the command line app or you want the desktop app to work and you don't want that error to come when you go in the browser, it needs to have that signed cert. But those desktop apps don't have a bypass for unsigned certificates. So an example is going to be, and I'll, I'll pull this up for just so you guys understand. So we're going to go here, and this works for uh, any of them. So we're going to go and go to account and log out. Yes. And then we're going to go settings, and you put in the server URL right here. This works for the browser extension as well. So we're going to go ahead, whoops, probably don't didn't need to do that. Go here, settings, lock, log out, confirm you want to log out. Same thing up here. There's where we can go and uh, put in whatever it is, HTTPS, and if you leave it blank, it goes back to the Bitwarden vault. But if that does not have a properly signed certificate, it won't work. It will work in the browser. It will work with the browser extension. It won't work with the command line app, and it won't work with the desktop app, and it won't work with the mobile app. So if you choose to go with self-signed certificate when you're hosting this, um, and you just don't want any exposure, that is a limitation you will run into. Granted, you could recompile these, you could you know, set the flag in there to allow a self-signed cert, or you can take a self-signed cert and add it to your trust store of each device that's going to attach to it. Those are other options, but I wanted to throw them out there and just mention that, because that was something I thought was not really a terrible thing, because obviously using self-signed certs, uh, it's a good thing in some ways, because if you had a signed cert and all of a sudden it wasn't signed um, because maybe your server got hijacked or something like that and the cert change, it's probably good that it prompts you and doesn't just log right in. The other side of that is I think you should be able, as if you're advanced enough to understand how to set up a self-hosted Docker image on a server, that you should be able to say, you know what, I want absolutely no exposure. I don't want anything but my own certificate that I generated uh, inside of here and I don't feel like loading it in a trust store, I should be able just to, you know, log into it locally. I don't know. I'm, I'm probably being nitpicky about that, but throwing it out there. But my overall, like I said, my feelings on Bitwarden, I really like it. It's got a lot of features. Uh, when you compare it to LastPass, uh, it has really everything I had in LastPass I now have in here, but more. The way it handles organizations is a big plus. Um, I don't use this feature but maybe I should, I haven't really played with it. It does have a pin option, which is kind of cool. So instead of you typing your master password each time, you can uh, have a pin in the browser. So you unlock the browser when you open it with the plugin, and then you only have to type in a shorter pin number. That way, each time you want it to load a password, you have to put a pin in that shorter versus typing your longer password when you want to have it more secure and locked. But I, I'm absolutely, I, don't mind typing the longer password, and uh, my own habit is even after I push my computer away, I press the lock key to lock it out and frequently close thing. That's just good security practice, because then if I get up and walk away and I left my uh, password manager login, someone could obviously go in and start looking at passwords or something. I, yeah, maybe I'm getting a little overcautious, but when you handle a lot of people's secure information, I don't think you can be too cautious. But my overall, I, I love the product. I'm happy with the self-hosted. Like I said, to me, self-hosting it reduces the threat surface if you're not exposing it to the internet. If you are someone who's not sure how to update Docker or you don't keep your server itself very secure because you're just not familiar with those things, in my opinion is going to be if those are not things you're familiar with, then you are making a less secure product and you're probably best left to the folks at Bitwarden to keep the product up to date. If you're experienced enough to start following these instructions, set up the server, get everything set up properly, you are 
doing better. Um, you can really reduce your threat surface and have it completely locked down internally and do all kinds of restrictions on it that maybe you wouldn't be able to do there. But so that when it comes to security, it comes down to what are you comfortable with? Where is, you know, your efforts should be put? It's not something I can easily answer for people. People always ask me, is a self-hosted more secure? And I have to say it depends because I've seen people self-host apps and make tragically bad mistakes and they don't know how they're doing it. They actually create a bigger security hole for themselves, especially with the risk of, let's say you have a server that you don't keep very well, it gets compromised, has some type of malware on there that then grabs your master password and lives there silently while they slowly creep through all of your passwords because you did not properly secure your server and they were able to start listening to all the traffic and manipulate your server. So your skill at locking down a server is gonna be very dependent whether or not you should be the self-hosting of this or not. And of course, if you're self-hosting and you're not exposing it, well, then you've reduced the risk. So even if you're not good at it, they still have to get inside your network. So that does create another barrier. So those are my overall thoughts on Bitwarden. I'm really happy with the product. Uh, if there's questions, comments, concerns, uh, great. Uh, let me know. I'm going to have this linked over in my forums. It's a great place to ask questions. Um, or if there's you know, troubleshooting and things like that. I mean, I'm willing to help a little, but they do have their own support and discourse forums. So I'm highly recommend if you have a lot of troubleshooting problems with it, because I didn't have problems with it. I thought it the documentation was good and it just worked and I was so impressed with it. Um, they have support forums that they have discussion. They also have a subreddit uh, where there seems to be a lot of people answering questions as well. So the, go to the uh, reddit slash r bitwarden and uh, have a discussion with other people in there too. There's a lot of Q and A, just read through. Um, so, you know, don't believe me. Uh, look at other people's thoughts on the product and everything else. And um, it, it's great. So it, it gets a thumbs up from me. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.